The man who knew Dick Blick is John F. Palillo, and this is how he looked when I delivered his Register Mail newspaper in the early 1950s. He's 83 now in 2009, and he's one of those people of humble beginnings who was able to learn and accomplish much. He'll recall for us his life in Galesburg, and he'll tell us about an elegant, mysterious man. I've never met anyone who actually knew him, so this is interesting to me just to find out what he was like. And yeah, it, it was uh, after the war, 1944, 45, 46, and everybody was back home and the taverns were booming. And, and uh, then the tavern, and I was tending bar, and, uh, uh, and then the tavern business, everybody started getting married and having kids, and it settled down and the package liquor business started. And I worked in the first package liquor store ever in Galesburg, and it was on Prairie Street. The Purity Tap is when I worked there across from the West Theater, and Olson Brothers, who had five taverns, and we you know, centralized, it was quite an operation. That was a, that's a story in itself, is the Olson Brothers tavern business. But uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a great package liquor, cheeses, and it was just, better than anything we've got now in Packy's Liquor, even, even the new hy V. But uh, anyway, uh, then FM radio was coming. So I was standing bar and going to college, FM radio was coming in. And the two first FM stations were Canton and Burlington, which is strange, not Pe Peoria or Quad Cities. Mm -hmm. So we were putting up FM antennas to get enhanced reception and repairing radios. And, uh, and, then, and then this thing TV was looming. And so I thought, well, I'd been a radar, I ran a radar repair station off San Diego and right looking at Point Loma at N North Island. And uh, I always wanted to go back. John's been out there on business. Uh, I talked about the ferry boat and he said, no, they got a beautiful causeway now and it uh, goes up like that so the, the battleships can clear it, you know. But anyway, I, I ran a radar repair station there for about uh, 18 months. And uh, so on. I was 18 years old, 19 years old. I came home then, at, well, at this time, and I thought, well, radar is TV both ways. So now here's TV, and WOC was going to take care of the transmitter. All I had to do was take care of the receiver, so it was a piece of cake. So I was one of the few people in the county who could understand and repair a TV set. So I got a TV set and put a big antenna on my dad's house. It looked like the tail wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. And when they threw the... Uh, the switch in, at WOC, why we had uh, several sets in the window on Prairie Street, and we actually, the cops came by because we blocked traffic. People were actually standing out in Prairie Street watching the test pattern. And uh, so I went into the TV business for three years. It just, uh, there were, jobs were hard to get in 1950. I got a, I graduated from college. And uh, so anyway, I'm in this music store. We had Magnavox and Motorola TV. And, uh, so it was Byerly? Byerly Gamble Music, and uh, across from the West Theater. And Magnavox was the uh, uh, the premier line. It was like like Cadillac and Chevrolet, really, and, and even smaller Chevys. But so we had both lines. But the Magnavox line was furniture at Drexel Cabinetry, beautiful furniture, styling, and and uh, so one morning. Like on a Tuesday morning. Now this is important, a Tuesday morning, because he looked like that on Tuesday morning. <laughs> you know, really, and he, you know, you would go and look at a TV, you and I like this. But he was dressed like that, I think, all the time. Never saw him other than in a formally dressed, even at his house. But um, so the, the owner, and I won't mention names, but he, uh, he was a high-pressured salesman, and, you know, you twist your arm and knock you down and sell something. And I couldn't do that. I had to convince you of product knowledge. And so it took me time, but if I had the time, so, 
So I ended up with a pretty good batting average. He had about a 10% sales average or less, and I had a 90 or better. <laughs> and uh, I think people finally realize this is complicated. <coughs> and this, and maybe this Dago kid knows what he's talking about, and they kind of, uh, anyway, I sold a lot, but it took, it took an hour to sell a TV. I couldn't do it. Yeah. So anyway, in comes this gentle man, a gentleman, and a gentle man. And he, we go back and we had this big center room with most of the TV, and I had a mock-up of a rotor and an antenna, and, uh, and we had a bare chassis of TV showing picture tube and components and, and the fact that it was, wasn't just a screen, you know, a magic yeah. thing like, like now with the plasmas and the LCDs, but... It's magic now. Yeah, it's magic now. See, so you, you, you digital dudes, as I called you, <laughs> you push a button and all hell breaks loose, and we, we, we had to work for our information. <laughs> But <clears throat> so, so we, we talked antennas, and we had a little $129 Motorola, believe it or not, a little screen about that big. And then we had $199, and then we had the Magnavox line, which went all the way up to about 3000 bucks. And oh, wow. on, on furniture, yeah, see, oh, but you goodness. had a beautiful cabinet. You know, you could get traditional and Chinese Chippendale. Mm -hmm. and I didn't, we didn't even have furniture growing up let alone, you know, <laughs> and all of a sudden I got to appreciate early American and uh, furniture styling and whatever. So, but I'm taking this quiet gentleman on, on a tour of television land and, we, and about an hour goes by and uh, he says, uh, he had this three-piece suit with a vest with the sharp collar, the big collar, you know, I don't know what that's called, but and uh, he had the gold, the big watch fob. And so then he stops me. He, and he says, M Mr. P P Polillo, he said, I, I must be going now. I must go home, take medication before lunch. But I'll come back this afternoon and we can continue our visit. <laughs> now that's, that's, I can't remember breakfast, but that I, you, you know. That. So, fine. So he brochures and off he goes. And the proprietor of the store, he says to me, chastised me, he says, what's the matter with you? And I said, what do you mean? Don't you know who that was? And I said, well, no. And I didn't. He said, well, I was Dick Blick. He said, you should have been showing him the, you know, the high end of the, the Cadillac and not anyway. I said, well, he didn't have a name tag and I couldn't tell. <laughs> So, uh, I, but he said he would be back, and, uh, and he said, well, they all say that. I said, well, but they, used, they did come back, and they uh, didn't come back for him, but they came back for me, <laughs> but they really did. So, and uh, yeah, high pressure Charlie, we called him, and I, but uh, so anyway, that afternoon, the phone rings and the uh, secretary is sitting there and somehow she seemed to know about the conversation. It was about three o'clock and I'm up front with a customer. And she says that she could hear Gamble's part of it and interpreted Dick Blick's part of it. And he said, I told your Mr. P Palillo, and he kind of always would stop at P Palillo and whether it's a complicated name or whether he had a little bit of a stammer, I don't but I, I don't want to say that because he, he's just such a nice man. Uh, he said, I told him I would be in, but I'm not feeling well, and I won't be coming in. But he gave me the brochures, and, would you, and I know he doesn't have it in stock, but would you tell him I would like the Magnavox Regency <laughs> with the super antenna and the rotor and the booster? And all of a sudden, here is like that, about a $2,500 sale, $1950. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, of course, uh, Gamble was beside himself because he never could do that. And, uh, <laughs> and, and anyway, so, so, they, so we installed the set. And, uh, and then I got to go out, of course. And in those days, there were a lot of knobs on TV sets, and they were complicated to adjust. And then there were repair <laughs> criteria stuff, situations. Mm -hmm. So they would call me and uh, they would ask if I would come out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, 
Uh, they, you mean Mr. and Mrs. Blick? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Blick. And I think they lived on maybe Beecher or... Uh, In describing Dick Blick's appearance when he came into the store that morning, and I was talking to my wife about it a little bit, and I had a term, and I don't want to use the term because it's not very complimentary. And uh, but she said, "Nyman, Arthur Nyman Sr. Did you ever see him? He was always. I think they were both maybe of English background and very staid and very uh, formal." And uh, he had the watch, you know, and the, the jeweler, and and he was, so anyway, I, uh, professorial maybe is, mm -hmm. is, is a nice term. Mm -hmm. uh, stuffy, stayed, no, not nice. They, they were they were both nice. Mm -hmm. Nyman was a jewel, and this guy was too. So anyway, they would ask if I would come out at uh, 3 in the afternoon. So I would go out at 3 in the afternoon and we would take care of the adjustment or whatever and then they would ask me if, uh, if I would like a cup of tea. So we would have tea and then we would have a visit. And I got the impression that they enjoyed my company. I had charisma. <laughs> no, I could talk on most subjects and, and they seemed to enjoy. I, I got the impression they might have been lonely. I don't think they had a lot of, I think he'd had success it was 1950, so 49, 50, 51, that. Mm -hmm. And I think he, you know, had sold the business by then, I understand. It was 50. 1948. 40, okay. So, um, and she seemed a little more socially attuned than he. He just seemed confident in, in himself. There are very few photos of Dick Blick. Here's one, probably taken with the business in the Bondi building after 1933. The mail room is busy. Here's a desk he used in the early years of the business. And here is a later picture of Blick. He might be 65 here if this is 1948, just before the business was sold to Robert Metzenberg. Going way back, we know that for a few years until 1905, Blick was a newspaper reporter in Muscatine, Iowa. On a trip back to Galesburg, he found a job which more suited his talents at O.T. Johnson's where he became a window dresser and sign writer. In 1910, on a shopping trip to New York, he noticed a new pen which made fancy sign writing and other artwork much easier. After an agreement with a manufacturer, he sold thousands of these Paysamp pens by mail order. At that time, Blick called the business the Card Writers Supply Company. Meanwhile, Blick and wife Grace were crafting brushes and other art supplies in the kitchen of their West Main Street home. The business moved to the Bank of Galesburg building in 1928. In 1933, Blick needed more space and moved to the Bondi building. These photos show the impressive amount of space there in the basement. These outbound mailbags indicate the success of the mail order business. And here is the best photo of Dick Blick that we know of. It first appeared in the 1933 catalog. If the picture was taken in 1933, he'd be 51 here. But I found them to be a nice, kind, gentle people, and maybe, maybe at that time, maybe kind of lonely. And, uh, Did they have children, do you know? No. And no, they didn't. No, they didn't. I think they had a nephew out east and that they would refer to. And, uh, <coughs> and I think I was probably as close a friend, and I don't know, I think they were fond of me. And, but as you say, what's not to be? No. I, but uh, so anyway, uh, they were just kind, gentle people. And uh, I think, you know, they, they were not socialites or anything like that and uh, and then so then it was maybe he passed away when Karen do you remember uh, well no I don't know exactly. I, I, maybe John maybe.
Yes, if because that's when I sure. I'm sure that was when he passed away. So. Um, I'm trying to think. I I know I was uh, was doing magneto development, maybe the Long Boy ignition and uh, outboard Johnson uh, Evinrude outboard motor ignition. We had a, a hundred units running on test stands one Saturday morning, and and a, and the chief uh, engineer Hal Williams came was there. And, and I'm down working like this, and he's telling a story about Marv Behrens, who was the superintendent, and that he overhauled a Model T Ford. And it's easy on a Model T Ford to get things mixed up. I don't fully understand that. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he overhauled it, and then he's in the garage, and he put it in what he thought was reverse. He turned around like that, gave it the gas, and drove right through the front of the garage. <laughs> and uh, when he hit that punchline, I, I kind of laughed, and I... I swallowed, and I swallowed, and there was a big lump right here, huh. and there was a big uh, tumor of some kind trapped under the clavicle. So I go down to Dr. Johnson, uh, Dr. Malstrom, and yeah, by God, by God, there is a bump there. And I said, well, yeah, I, you know. They, but anyway, they later on, big old Dr. Johnson went in there, and <laughs> so I was in with that. Did you know Mr. Lamb at Upward Marine? Yes, yeah. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack Lamb. Yeah, yeah. He was a foreman of. Uh, a paint line, a lot of other hard-working guy, nice guy. And a matter of fact, he was the caretaker factory manager in the end. T towards the end out there, boy, the end of a big factory is a sad thing to see. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, his wife lived next to me and dad on Hawkins. And yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, the Nair building, which was our OMC building, on the north east corner of that building was a nice big office and it was the f vice president factory the uh, division managers and next w office was the factory manager and in the last year and a half I had both those offices <laughs> but there were only about 15 people out there but Jack Lamb was in charge of the place and phasing it out and I was traveling to Hong Kong, Mexico, and the Sun Belt, and and it's really tough to see a big factory like that where it was dispersed to uh, Manawa, Wisconsin, and Sardis, Mississippi, and Oxford, Mississippi, and mm. Burnsville, North Carolina, Spruce Pine, North Carolina, and uh, El Paso, and all oh, those had to be shut down. They're all gone now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we were, I was traveling because a part of every the flywheels went here and in Hong Kong stuff, stuff went there and uh, but it's really scary a lot of people don't understand you know that they pay they say well they pay 70 cents an hour in Mexico I'm sure and our dollar an hour in Hong Kong yeah and no benefits that's it but the uh, the real impact is is you have this this room full of money that you save with labor and then they automate, they bought robots. So not only was it low, inexpensive, but they, they had higher quality, more dependable fabrication. So it really is a terrible double line. But it, but it really is terrible to see how a major factory like Maytag, and, and then after I retired, I, I was traveling to all these places in, in Hong Kong, and it was kind of a nice experience, good way to end a career, really. And, and then I got into statistical process control, and and out at Gates Rubber and Adams Press Metal and Maytag and Butler and Caterpillar and mm. so uh, anyway I like to say I've seen the enemy and but I don't want to call him that because I was fond of the Chinese people and well, the you knew a lot of stuff mm -hmm. so yeah. you could go to these different places yeah yeah I really I really you know for a kid growing up in the south side of Galesburg out there on East 4th Street with Without food or without clothes or without, Mom always used to say, "Itene libera e mangiare." I like that, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so if you've got books and food, something to read and food to eat, you can't miss being successful. Well, well I, I interviewed Virginia Hinchliffe yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Did you? Have her for a teacher? No, but my kids did. Yeah. My daughter Annie did. And she had uh, humble beginnings. Oh, there. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, it was really unbelievable down there. And then we were different. We looked different. We spoke 
mom and pop couldn't read and write, couldn't speak the language. And, Did they uh, come from the old country? Yeah, pop came yeah. from Sicily and mom from Naples. And, uh, hmm. and it is pretty remarkable that, uh, and how we got to be technical, I don't know, but my brother Bill, <laughs> you know, really, we, it's kind of weird. And uh, mm -hmm. we really didn't have books and things. And, uh, but Bill and Pete ran the phone company, and I mean, Bill was chief engineer of the... Interstate phone? Yeah, they actually, Bill was chief engineer for DDD and, out and whatever, and Pete was, uh, he had, um, uh, he came out of the Navy as a radio operator, and he's, he was both in uh, the U-boat thing out in the Atlantic, and then he, he was on a destroyer ex escort, he, and, then, and then afterwards in the Pacific. So, uh, and, jo and my brother George was... Uh, in the Philippines, and uh, my brother Bill then was later in the Korean conflict. Show me your brothers. And he was in the Korean conflict, my brother Bill, and uh, he was. Upper in, left is George. Yeah, George, yeah. and then Pete, and then myself. Let's see you. Oh yeah. And then yeah. this is Bill. That's Bill, your younger brother. Yeah, okay. and he was chief engineer, and then uh, and then Pete was. Uh, he had outlying exchanges, Knoxville, Avon, Watauga, and Cameron, <clears throat> and uh, uh, and he had back then the beginning of radio telephones, the, the first beginning of cell phones. Did you know Don Bradley? Yes. <laughs> I My taught. dad was with him when he died. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, dad, back in the beginning of those Radio telephones? Yes. Dad, we got a call one evening, and uh, Don was on the phone. He says, look out in front. And him and probably Bud Larman or somebody were out in the car out there on the phone. <laughs> well, well, you know, even before that, my brother Bill, he lived on 6th Street, sit off of Chambers. Pete and I had the first um, CB radios in Galesburg. Hmm. And then, and Bill, he called, asked me to come by, so I drove out there, and we got this, the CB radio, and he had hooked onto the CB radio, a telephone. We got in his car and we drove around, and we're talking on this CB radio telephone. That was the first cell phone ever in Knox County, yeah. cool. and he just thought he could make some. You know, he really, he was a good inventor. He, he came by my house one night. I just got out of the shower. It was J J uh, Johnny Carson was, or even mm -hmm. maybe before that even. But and the headlight pull in the drive, and I thought, God, it's almost 11, 10:30. And <clears throat> so I go to the door. It's my brother Bill, and he's got a electric meter. He says, Oh, he's, what time is it? <laughs> you know, he was just. <laughs> and I said, Well, it's okay. Come on. What do you want? Come in. So we go down to my bench, my workshop downstairs. He takes this meter and he hooks it onto my telephone line, picks up the phone and he calls down at the whatever the office downtown mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he tells the guy, he says, he said, give me 30 seconds and call me back. He takes this Illinois power and light meter and he takes the dials and he goes three, six, two, one. And we wait. And the phone rings and the guy says three, six, two, one. We're reading that electric meter via the telephone line. So he actually had a patent on that thing, hmm. which unfortunately should have been worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had several other patents, and unfortunately he made a few dollars, but should have made big money. And, and uh, so, but here, you know, coming out of that, that little Italian immigrant family in the Seventh Ward that was different, and nobody really liked us, it's still hard <laughs> to believe. But <laughs> anyway. I did what I did, and Pete and Bill did what they did, and uh, and then you know uh, one other little anecdote. Uh, one Sunday, my brother Bill called, and he said, uh, "Are you?" He was, he, he was the nicest man ever in Galesburg. My brother Bill. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I I'm a good guy. My Pete, these were good guys. You're not a bad guy. This guy was head and shoulders <laughs> held. Just no question. But anyway, he called. He said, "Are you you busy?" And I said, "Well, no. What do you need?" He said, uh, the fellow next door, he said, he said he's been on the road all week. And uh, he said, I don't know he's either a salesman or a sales manager for Dick Blick Art Supplies. Hmm. 
and he said he's just got home and today is Sunday they're rebroadcasting the University of Illinois football game and he said and he was so looking forward to that and his TV set quit yeah. and I said well what's it doing he told me and I said well I think you need a 6W4 damper tube and he says have you got one I said yeah so he came out and got it and they put it in he said well it didn't work I said can you bring the chassis in he said yeah he said uh, I said, is either one of you sober? <laughs> he said, well, we just, he said, we've only had one beer. And uh, so about an hour, half an hour later, well, here comes these two guys and maybe a Cadillac. It's Jack Wyatt. Oh, it's, really? It's my brother Bill and Jack Wyatt, who was sales manager and then CEO and on and on. I don't know right. what of Dick Blick. Oh, they're in that oh. picture there. And uh, yeah, there on the, on the far right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, they, um, uh, sure enough, we looked and there's a fuse and we clipped a new one on and it worked. They took it back and he got to watch his football game. And uh, <laughs> like I say, that's not historically significant possibly, <laughs> but maybe it is. So anyway, that's kind of uh, uh, all I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, my little granddaughter up in Libertyville and she was setting a table and and bossing everybody around as to where they should sit and, and I says Emily I said you do a pretty good job at that I said you could be a school teacher he says well pop pop I'm, I'm pretty little I said well, I mean when you grow up <laughs> and she says you mean as big as mommy I said yeah when you're as big as your mommy and uh, she said well maybe I could because I know a lot of stuff <laughs> and, I, and you're right I know a lot of stuff yeah I really do I think it's, I think maybe had I known more about less. I could have made more money, but I really know a lot of stuff. What did your father, what kind of work did he do? Well, he was a section section hand on the railroad. He worked oh. like worked like an animal on okay. you know, three bucks a week and then didn't work oh. all, you know, yeah, we, uh, uh, and the, the mom, boy, she picked dandelion greens and she saw, t my mom was the best cook ever in Galesburg. <laughs> I mean, my brother Bill was the nicest guy ever. My mom was the best cook ever, <laughs> including Nunk Man Jerry at the heart, all of them. But mom was, and uh, oh, she was magic with, uh, and, uh, but she'd saute bandolin greens. They were just awesome. And, and, uh, and then Pop would bring things home from the, uh, the yards. It looked a little bit like rhubarb, but it wasn't. And they called it Cardona. And I don't know what, I, they knew it was edible. Golly. <laughs> and they cut that and they'd saute that and you know I think just and the depression was you know I was born in 26 so in, in 1930 I was you know in 32 I was six years old and, uh, yeah. and and it was that depression was just as bad as people are hinting that it is it yeah. was and uh, so here's these poor old pop and and, and if it weren't for the uh, father Doubleday who was the pastor at Corpus Christi in those days he said, send the boys down with a wagon, but we didn't have a wagon. But we borrowed a wagon and we go down and he'd give us a bag of uh, northern beans, white beans, mm -hmm. and Occident flour. Occident was the big name, Robin Hood flour and Occident flour. Right. And, <clears throat> and of course mom baked bread and made, made pasta, made, you know, mm -hmm. and boy, well, she'd cut that like, like they do on TV. and. Uh, but, uh, but that's really what kept that whole family alive. There were seven of us, and uh, seven kids, and mom and pop. And uh, so did your dad keep the job all the, through oh, the depression? Yeah. And he, he, yeah, and just uh, didn't make enough. To right, but then there was he was laid off at times, and uh, so. Uh, but you know, as you have your own kids, and you, uh, what a terrible thing in retrospect that for these parents not to be able to, to feed a kid. Mm -hmm. how, how tough that, what would you like to think you wouldn't be able to feed your kid, you know, what a right. terrible, but anyway, and then I, t I tell these stories sometimes, my wife says don't, she didn't want to hear those stories, they're too sad, it makes her cry, mm -hmm. well, I said, well, what was really sort of, in retrospect and looking back, it was significant was that so many people maybe observed that and really there were some people who helped like the old other Italian families the Ranellas who ended Ranella ended up owning 
all of downtown Galesburg because he, he hung on to it during the Depression. Hmm. And, and Ranella now is a G, G, G &M. G &M distributor. And all. But that's the, what, uh, Ranella. Anyway, he, um, my, he, he almost lost his mind during the Depression, but he ended up with several square blocks of downtown Galesburg, and that, and then there was Lager Messino, Lager Machino, and right. there was uh, Guadalabene. Guadalabene Watchwell would be the English, and he was my godfather, yeah. Antonio Guadalabene. God, what beautiful people! He and, and my godmother, and uh, Antonina, and uh, uh, I was an altar boy at his funeral. No, that's not right. I was at his funeral, and the priest said that he visited him in the hospital, and he was 90-some years old, first time he'd ever been sick or had been in hospital. And he said, I asked him, he said, Tony, he said, 90-whatever uh, is, is a long lifespan. How has it seemed? Has it seemed long? And he said, and the old man said to me, Ili passaje cum la umbra olinacte. Ninety-six years has passed like a shadow in the night. Mm. What a beautiful expression. Mm. Yeah. Umber, like an umbrella is a shadow maker. Mm. Anyway, yeah, the language is beautiful. That's, you know, we, we used to say, why don't we eat like the American kids? Well, we were eating better. <laughs> you know, we did, what we had you know, was better, really, but we didn't have very much of it. And why don't we talk like the American? Well, thank God we didn't. Boy, I learned a lot of stuff, a lot of bigger words from, because, uh, you know, 90% of the $5 words in the English language are nickel and dime words in Latin and Italian. Yeah. So, boy, if you get that, you you got a lot of bigger words. And um, mm -hmm. one time I went by my folks' house, got a 19-inch Motorola TV, and it was Sunday afternoon, and I was leaving, and I was going to adjust it for them. We had two stations at the time, WOC and you know, some channel 8, 4, whatever. I, I says, which channel do you want me to leave it on? I was going to adjust the fine tuning and so these old folks could watch a, good, a picture. Well, it was Meet the Press on one channel and the Lone Ranger on the other channel. Now, Mom said, watch this. Meet, she wanted to watch Meet the Press. Mom was, there was something <laughs> too bad to you. But anyway, and Pop says, no, he wanted to watch Lone Ranger. So, so I, Mom says, no, we watch it, meet the press, maybe you can not learn some of bigger words. <laughs> and Pop says, I'm a too old for learning bigger words, let's watch a cowboy show. <laughs> but anyway, I learned a lot of bigger words in the little Italian, you know, and then I had a lot of Latin, and I had two years of French, and so yeah, there's a lot of vocabulary, voca. Anyway, uh -huh. it really is pretty easy. From now the Italians, they had this dignity, they would talk to, address each other, Monsieur and Madame, that, that's the French for it. But it, they would never refer to my mother, my dad's wife, out of respect to my, very carefully how they referred to each other. And, uh, and so you really didn't want to insult people. And uh, yeah, they, you had to let them maintain their dignity. You had to be very careful. Because I, and I often said that if you took that handful of Italians seven or eight, a bit more in, in Abingdon than Galesburg, but, uh, and if you were to squeeze them to the irreducible minimum, and you look and you think, what is that? You'd find pride and dignity is what you'd find. God, it was just scary to think back and watch these people manipulate in this dignified manner, and most of whom didn't have a whole lot, and, uh, but the ones that had it, on Easter and Christmas and birthdays, then it was okay to send a basket of food and stuff, and that wouldn't insult your your dignity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I recall Lago Marcino yeah. making deliveries to Britain's Market next to where I used to yeah. live on Hawkinson and Losey. Yeah. Um, did you want to say something about those uh, the liquor business? And oh, yeah. Uh, you know, one more little anecdote about. Uh, you know, all of these uh, big distributorships, you know, and I, and I got 
got to be careful now because I God I can be I can be awful. We can edit. I can be <laughs> I can be terrible. You know this day go this day go temper. Yeah. This mafia also mentality is a terrible thing. And uh, yeah, usually you if you've ever I'm the only potential murderer you've ever talked to I think. But oh. uh, well, it depends on the all of a sudden you know forfeit. Wow, you have forfeited. And, but anyway, that's the rationale. Um, but, uh, but but anyway, they, they, they did well, and uh, at times. But then all the neighbors, you know, and there was uh, like public aid relief. It was called back then. I remember taking my dad across the railroad tracks and up to Cherry Street, like where old St. Mary's Hospital, in there, and then trying to explain to this old Italian man. I wasn't that old coming back. I was only that big. He was probably 50 or 60 that we weren't eligible for relief because he was not a naturalized citizen. Now you take 1932 or 34 or 5 and you're not eligible for relief. You're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, um, mm -hmm. so that was the thing that, uh, you know, it's like watching a train wreck develop and, and just say, well, let's watch it. Let's watch this train wreck. And somehow I think some other people should have been alone. But, Anyway, that's another. But one time, my godfather, and most of these, Ranella and all of Gar Lagermachino and, and Guadalabene, all of Calderon, it turned out to be the Blatt's distributor, and they had a place on Main Street. And uh, he, he used to come by and had a, a wagon, and a, a horse drawn, to, and then a truck. And I remember we're out playing in the yard, and, and here comes my godfather in the truck. And um, so he, uh, we watch him, and he gets out of the truck, and uh, he's got a big stock of bananas. And he walks to the back, and knocks on the door, and my mom comes to the door, and, and they pass pleasantries. Bon uh, après uh, midi, that's French, but a good, a good afternoon, mademoiselle, madame, my mother, very polite, very proper. And they're talking, did you know that Mrs. Tabone was in hot so and so back, whatever. And then he says to her, Qui cosa bisogna? Is there anything you need? And mom would kind of look around and peruse her memory banks and say, No, niente, nothing. There's nothing we need. And I'm standing there and I think, hell, you, you, you name it, we need it. You know? But this, this song and dance, mm -hmm. this dignity thing was going on. Mm -hmm. And he said, ah, fa bene, that's good. So then he turns, oh, he said, I wonder, the bananas. He said, I will be putting the truck away for the weekend. It was always Friday when he came. Do you suppose the children would, would like them? And I thought, hell, we'll have them eaten before you get to the truck. She said, well, perhaps they would like them. And he handed, that was the whole purpose of stopping, was to give her the bananas. All the rest was kabuki theater. Funny thing. Isn't that I beautiful? Remember, yeah, that's a great story. I remember my old uh, great-grandmother, Effie Mae Richardson, telling me that, that Grandpa Richie, M.M. for Millage Miller Richardson, handled the bananas when they came to town. He handled the banana warehouse or something. Mm -hmm. So I should have, you know, I should have gotten a tape recorder and recorded her. Oh. She died at age 99 in 1975. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I have a, I taped my mother and her sister who came from Chicago. My dad's first wife, George, and my sister Lucille's mother, she died in the flu epidemic of 1918. Uh, that we're all talking about now. Uh, and uh, so then this poor old Italian man with two little children needed a wife. So in Chicago where all the relatives were and so then my Aunt Nancy, Nunziato, she was there and she, well, she had a younger sister in, in Italy. And uh, so anyway, uh, there, was a, there was a marriage ceremony performed in, in Italy and one performed here, proxy. They were married by proxy, which meant then she could emigrate as his wife. They never saw each other until she showed up as his wife in this country. <laughs> and uh, oh God, and mom, uh, 
boy, when they, they, they'd get into arguments and she'd say, uh, I don't know. Oh, and, and of course, the Italians, you know, they can argue with the hands and the, the whole bit, you yeah. know. And she says, I know would have married you. I would have married a cowboy. She would have married a cowboy instead of, <laughs> and we, I don't know what she, but anyway, uh, so, uh, well, um, well, now, yeah, the only other thing, you know, back when I was talking about the early television days, back then, okay. there was uh, Byerly Gamble Music on Prairie, and there was Berg, the big Philco dealer, over on uh, Simmons Street. Okay. Uh, that was a big operation there, and it was, Philco was big in those days. And then Lindstrom on Main Street, of course, and then Admiral on Main, further down, I forget the name of the, boy, that name. And Dun and Julian was there. Oh, yeah. And then Sears had TV. Black's Hardware had uh, General Electric, and then other appliance stores. There was an appliance store down by Sears, and they had a had a line of TVs. And then late later, Carson Peary Scott. No, who, who uh, where Lindstrom is downtown now? That Black big and cool. Black and Cool came, and they had uh, they had the, they got the Magnavox line. We tried to stop it, but they somebody explained to us that. Black and Cool and Carson Peary Scott maybe too were part of them, that they were bigger than Byerly Gamble, so they, we weren't going to keep them from getting the Magnavox line. And uh, and then back to the, uh, like I said, the, the Olsen brothers, that, that might be a story. You know, they, uh, two brothers, there was George and Oscar, and uh, and they ended up, uh, they had, uh, well when I, uh, I was coming out of church one day, one day, and there was a fellow named Leo Kennedy, and he said, uh, he said, John, I understand you're looking for a job. And I said, yes, we're looking for a bartender. And I said, well, I don't know anything about bartending. And he said, well, we can teach you that. He says, we have trouble teaching honesty to bartenders. You can either drink the business away or give it away or steal it. And, and I, as I got into it, I, I saw how all three were possible. So anyway, I went down and I started attending bar at the White Elephant on Boone's Avenue, which is Park Plaza. Boone's and Alley? It was Boone's Alley. Yeah. And it was a nice cloverleaf bar, and that's where that picture was taken. You and? Jean Rousseau. He's on the right. Yeah. Okay. Jean Rousseau was, uh, he was in the Army, and he ended up out here at the uh, Mayo General Hospital. And then he met a local girl, and they married, and so he stayed and became he was the head bartender at the White Elephant, and uh, well, and he was quick, like a Bostonian. You know, they talk quick, and he was fast, and God, he was a great bartender. And I started <clears throat> attending bar, and I, you, you'd think I was in a chemistry lab, you know, pouring a shot of booze, you know. <laughs> and pretty soon I got so I could throw it around pretty good. But he taught me, and then sometimes they would send me to one of their other places. They had the one on Prairie Street called the Purity Tap then, later it was called the Copacabana, and uh, the, this, the bank parking lot is the whole thing in there now. There was uh, McGrew and McGrew Insurance and Clay's Wallpaper, and which, and that became the packaged liquor store, and then the tavern. What about the Alcazar? Yeah, the Alcazar was on Main Street, and it was a bar and uh, a lot of pool tables. Yeah. Real, a lot of, I guess a lot of railroaders went there when they got paid. Yes, yeah, and then there was a place on uh, coming up on Sem South Seminary there, uh, Meads, Meads Home, uh, that uh, caddy corner from uh, Peoples. There was Bob's Tavern there, and, and most on payday, a lot of them didn't heading for our end of town, Fourth Street, down around Carl Sandberg's place. Um, they didn't get past Bob's place with a paycheck, which is kind of sad, really. <laughs> and uh, I think, but then Olson's had uh, they had a place on the square, which was Skid Row in those days, and one morning I got there about 10 o'clock and they said, Johnny, see I was, I was Johnny once, I was, I, was, I was even a baby once, anyway, <laughs> and they, uh, would you help us out, go down there for now, the bartender didn't show up, and we'll get you out of there as quick as we can, and I thought, wow, I go down there, I never saw 
10 o'clock in the morning, such heavy drinking and so many fights. I was 120 pounds. I didn't want, and I thought, God, I'm not going to get out of here alive. But anyway, they had that Skid Row place there, the whole bunch of them in the uh, southeast corner of the square. And then, then they had a place in the, uh, above the Nyman Jewelry, the Labor Temple was above Nyman Jewelry at the time, and they had a bar there, and so I'd go there and tend bar. And then they had a place in Watauga, and they had centralized purchasing. I'm talking 1945. And you imagine, you know, it was pretty, so, so anyway, then one by one they, uh, they all folded, of course. And, uh, and the last was that Oscar opened up a diner at Okwaka. The Okwaka Diner mm -hmm. was, uh, was George's, and his son, George Jr., ran it, and I'm not sure who, what's, who's running it now. But, and then Oscar, he, he was in charge of the Knox County Fair, chairman of the fair committee for years on. And I remember down in the seventh ward, uh, Woolsey. He was older than us guys, but but he was nice to us kids. You know I, how the older guys didn't want the younger ones playing or hanging around. But he was nice, Alvin Woolsey. And damn, he didn't. He was. He lived in the first house, maybe south of High Low Grocery, and he didn't come back from the war. And uh, mm -hmm. and Busher, Edwin Busher. There was a busher working here, um, mm. it might be his nephew. He didn't come back from the war, and Jack Benarchik, and uh, Well, uh, the Battle of Midway, when you look at that, all the naval uh, the carrier aircraft, the Wildcats, the Hellcats, the SBD Dauntless, the, uh, the F4U Corsair. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the Bearcat was the latest. Those were the aircraft that we serviced all of the electronics on, on North Island off San Diego. Okay. You look out that plexiglass window on the third floor of a hangar, and any day you could look out and see 3,000 aircraft on this monstrous mm -hmm. landing strip. Yeah. And we think about the time you, you go out and, and you plug in and you check the IFF identification friend or foe, make sure you're not shot off out of the sky by your own people. And then uh, the com communications two-way, and then the, uh, uh, the radar, which hung under the wing. But anyway, I say to people, if you watch the movie The Midway, all those aircraft are the aircraft that I worked on. And because my technician out at Yale, out at Alboard Marine, he used to kid me. He said, uh, yeah, all of his stuffs are in the Smithsonian. Well, he was a naval uh, airborne technician too and then later his aircraft got to be pretty old too as he got older and, mm -hmm. but but anyway all those uh, is that those, where you learned your technology your uh, electronics and stuff yeah I actually, the, you're right they gave Navy. me they gave me two years uh, I got two years equivalent college in the Navy and so I was going to be an electrical engineer and I was heading down to the University of Illinois and you wouldn't believe what was going on there after the war all the GI you know everybody was down there and you go into a physics class and you get into a, a big auditorium of a thousand guys and you're number 691. And uh, I finally and I left there and I went to Knox and all of a sudden you got, there's five guys in this, uh, this nuclear physics class. And, and the prof would say something and you'd frown, something wrong with that concept, John? Mm -hmm. Think of the, the contrast between, you know, the individual attention and class size and whatever. But yeah, I, uh, I was a pretty good uh, radio repairman before I went into the Navy and took a class and got, but then I did get uh, at uh, a boot camp and then pre-radio in Theodore Herzl Junior College and then Oklahoma A&M and all these secondary. So we had to, it was about, you went to school six days, a, five and a half days a week and, uh, and then you, uh, but anyway, it was worth two years of college equivalent, and uh, uh, but 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 the radar, you know, that's like I say, TV both ways. You know, you you send the beam out and pick it up, so you, you're responsible for the whole thing. And uh, so you were you were at U of I, <coughs> uh, just briefly, and then okay. uh, 
And then we had a session, uh, U of I was here in Galesburg, you know, and I went out there, but I didn't, no. I didn't really. <laughs> yeah, we had a, uh, right after the war, there was a, uh, it was up at the research, you know, the. State Research Hospital? Yeah, and, okay. and they, had, they there were classes there. It was actually, uh, okay. and uh, some friends of mine were there, and I used to go up and visit them, but I never took classes. I really, at the time, I thought, no, I don't think I want that. And uh, okay. So you went to Champaign? Yeah, yeah, and I didn't really stay there either, and so I ended up in Knox, hmm. and, and majored in physics and minored in math. One time in grade school, a uh, mom and pop couldn't read and write, so I used to sign my own report card. <laughs> and one time I go back and they call me into the superior's office at St. Joe's, and the nun gave me hell, because she knew it was my... I thought, well, but then, this thing, you know, they had in those days a lot of, you know, there were about six A pluses and about five A's, but I, but mom didn't know what an A was and didn't know. And but anyway, so I was really a pretty good student. And then in high school, I was a good student. And I remember my junior year or senior year, Knox College sent me a note that they were interested in offering me a scholarship. Thank you. I see what two o'clock. Two o'clock would have been terrible. <laughs> I told her two o'clock was my nap time, and I, I think maybe it's coming. Come. But anyway, it's getting close. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but anyway, I, I thought well, it, it was sort of a snob. Had a snobbish reputation. It was really suburban Chicago. People, kids coming down, you know. And, hmm. and uh, now I think it's. But anyway, it. Um, so I thought, what do they want with me, you know? And I and I just threw the paper away which is crazy when you think about it. So then I uh, go into the Navy, and towards the end then, a friend of mine from uh, Detroit, a little guy who had actually played first string for the University of Detroit and played in Madison Square Garden, and it was a real thrill to play basketball against that guy. Have a little guy like that out-rebound you. Okay. Anyway, uh, he, uh, we're reading Time Magazine, and we're reading about this thing called the GI Bill. Yeah. And he says, well, they're going to pay books and tuition and give you $75 a month, which was big money in 1945. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, so then he says, he asked me where I was going to go or if I was going to go. And he was a real character. And I said, well, I don't know. I, he said, well, when he came up and he said, you crazy goddamn Dago. He says, he said, if you don't end up in college, I'm going to personally come down to that rinky dink town of Galesburg and kick your all right around the, all around that public square. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I come home on leave then and I go over to Knox and I talk to the registrar and I ask my friend, yeah, your friend's right. And uh, he's bringing a, your uh, grade, grade uh, transcript. Transcript. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Char Charlie McCarthy and Edgar yeah. Bergen here. Uh, <clears throat> but. Uh, so anyway, I go over to Corpus Christi and uh, and I got the transcript and brought him over, and it was like straight A's, and so he said, well, there shouldn't be any problem. So then I uh, I went to Knox, and at the same time I was uh, putting up FM antennas and repairing radios and and getting into this TV thing that was coming, mm -hmm. and then after that, about three years and things, he he wasn't too happy and I wasn't too happy, and so I. Uh, answered an ad out at Outboard Marine. Well, actually, the, the chief engineer who came to town for ignition came in. He, was a, he liked to spend time at the bar. Mm -hmm. And he was and this big guy that ran the bar on Prairie Street, he said, well, I got the smartest technical guy in Knox County working here as a bartender. <laughs> He's talking about me. This big, you know, this guy couldn't spell tech, technology. You know? But anyway, sure enough, the guy called me. I got he hired me and uh, wow. so I started out as a designer and then uh, um, and then I you know then I started teaching classes in a factory and then found that I had a knack for teaching adults that's di you got to be careful with adults you can't you gotta they're yeah. intimidated you know you get a 60 year old electrician there and this guy's scared but the company says you go out there and take that course or you you, yeah. you got it mm -hmm. yeah. anyway you kind of Anyway, I developed a, a real neat uh, way of, of teaching adults, and uh, I, I did that for District 205, and then when the junior college was formed, a real beautiful guy, Dr. Masters, 
was head of vocational technical. He'd come from, he was principal at Canton High School. <laughs> so one day, so he's talking to District 205, and I forget the night, Chamberlain, nice guy. Everybody's gone now, but mm -hmm. anyway. He, uh, so I have phone rings out at work, and I pick it up, and he says, uh, Professor, he, you know, P-E-R, <laughs> Professor. He said, this is Dr. Master so-and-so. He said, I have it on good authority. Think of this now, word for word. On good authority that the vocational technical curriculum at Carl Sandburg will not be successful unless I convince you of coming to teach for us. Mm -hmm. And I laughed at him. <laughs> I said, well, I don't have a teaching certificate. No, he said, you don't need that. He said, the state requires that you have a certificate in the field and five years minimum experience in that field. So anyway, then I went out there and uh, like I say, I was there from day one, half time. And uh, so... Uh, out at, up where it is now? No, oh no, it started out at the Congregationalist Church. Oh. And mm -hmm. all those classrooms. Various buildings. Yeah, and then we went across the street to Brown's Business College. And then we went out to the Quonset Huts, out at the main campus, and then eventually the main campus. But yeah, I taught in, in all of them. And, uh, hmm. Yeah, and my dilemma now is I've got, I've got a room full of stuff. I mean, it's, it's good stuff, you know, and, and, and I got to throw it, I, you know, and I, I what, just, what, what kind of stuff? Well, it's course material for, you know, for 50 different courses for yeah. Carl Sandburg, for District 205, for yeah. statistical process control for any of the factories anywhere in the world. And uh, I, you know, I've even got an oscilloscope, and I can fix the TV set on a good day. Oh, down, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Are we about done? Yeah, I think so. Did you think of any? <laughs> you answered every question I would have had. Uh, yeah. yeah. As far as the Blicks, I, I just like I say, I think they were just nice, gentle people, and uh, yeah. And I was maybe one of their one of their better friends, and uh, mm -hmm. but. Uh, but it, but it was, you know, it's a real good, uh, the, the experience of his buying my TV, the TV from me, you know, is a real good idea in sales, you know. I remember going to Motorola and taking sales psychology courses, you know, and, and uh, little things like you never say, well, uh, you want to buy this set? You know, I say, which of these two fine set? You don't want to give them the opportunity to say, stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, I, uh, I couldn't do all that. I, all I could do is convince them that I knew what this was all about that I could make it work and whatever and, and that if you didn't buy it from me you were really missing the boat and uh, mm -hmm. so thank you very much thank you very much